Hello everybody! In this video we finally make our way to the first fundamental theorem of calculus. So uh, in order to prove this we're going to write down one lemma first. Uh, this is something actually earlier on in the semester I gave out as a homework assignment but we're just going to make sure we're all on the same page with it. So uh, I mean I'm going to write down here as a theorem but it's, it's kind of a lemma for for this uh, video. Uh, so the theorem here is going to be that if I have a function on a compact interval a, b, so uh, and in fact it'll be, we'll just write it, so uh, f, and we're going to use capital F here only because in the fundamental theorem I'm going to use a capital F, uh, but normally we'd use a lowercase f here. Uh, so if I have a function on this compact interval a, B. And if I know that its difference quotient is bounded in a very specific way, okay, so we're going to assume, um, so if, let's say, if here and if uh, there exists some positive constant m such that for all x and y not equal to each other in this interval a, b. And you'll see in a second why I don't want them equal. Um, we have that the absolute value of the difference quotient, the y difference quotient of f at x, is less than or equal to m. So if this is true, so remember this dqyfx just on the side here, right, d, q, y, f of x. This is equal to f of y minus f of x divided by y minus x. Uh, so if I, uh, if I know that this difference quotient, at least in absolute value, is bounded by this m, then this function f is uniformly continuous on the interval a, b. Okay, so this is a, a really nice way of being able to verify uniform continuity. You just look at this difference quotient, show that it's always bounded by some positive constant. And there's actually a name for this. We're, we're not really worrying about it too much here, but it's, it's probably good to know. This condition is often called the Lipschitz condition. So when you satisfy this condition, then you'd be called a Lipschitz function. And of course, this then is saying that every Lipschitz function is uniformly continuous. So very often you just want to deal with Lipschitz functions because it's an easy condition to write down. It implies uniform continuity. Lots of good things happen. Uh, it is certainly possible to build some uh, counterexamples to the converse. Okay, so if you know your Lipschitz, then you know you're uniformly continuous. You could be uniformly continuous without being Lipschitz. So, but we don't want to worry about that here. Uh, we're just going to give a, a nice, easy proof of this, uh, this theorem. So, uh, if I want to show that this function f is uniformly continuous, then I'm going to need to have an epsilon. So let's see here. We're going to let epsilon be greater than zero. And I need to show that if I choose elements that are close enough to each other, then the f image of those elements is going to be within epsilon. So uh, here's what we're going to do. Um, so let's make a little observation. If I look at the difference between, well, okay, I guess I'll, I'll take a couple of x's and y's. So uh, let's let x and y be in a, b. And uh, an obvious thing is if x is equal to y, well, I wrote not equal, but if x is equal to y, then the difference between their f images is going to equal zero. Uh, and that's definitely less than epsilon. So uh, we might as well assume that 
they are not equal to each other, which, okay, I said you are going to see why I wanted them not equal. You go back here, right? If I'm computing this difference quotient, I definitely don't want y and x to be the same. Okay, so assume x does not equal y. So now I again want to compute this difference, and I want to get it to be less than epsilon, provided I can get x and y close enough. So what I can do here is I can break this up by dividing by a y minus x and then multiplying by a y minus x. Okay, I'll put some absolute values in here. And this makes perfect sense to do because x is not equal to y. Okay, but this first bit here, this is just the absolute value of the difference quotient, which we know is bounded by this positive constant m. So this is going to be less than or equal to m times the absolute value of y minus x. Ah, and we just want to get this less than epsilon. So all we have to do is go back up here, say assume x is not equal to y, and that the difference between y and x is less than, oh, how about we'll say epsilon over m. Okay, so now this here is going to be less than m times epsilon over m, which is equal to epsilon. Okay, so this implies that f is uniformly continuous on AB. Awesome. Okay, so now we get to the first fundamental theorem of calculus. It'll be a nice consequence of what we just wrote down. So the first fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, by the way, I use this first because most of the time uh, I'm, I'm like reading this first. Uh, there are some books that will do what we're going to call the second fundamental theorem of calculus first. Um, my, I don't know, useless opinion, this one's a little more important in mathematics. Uh, the second one is certainly a lot more important in calculations. Uh, okay, but let's write it down. So first things, uh, we're going to have some function, little f, from a closed interval a, b to r. And we're going to assume right, that it's integrable. Okay, So that immediately lets us know this little f is bounded, and if we would need that. Okay, I want to define, and here comes the big F, define another function from that same closed interval a, b to r. And the way we're going to define it is with an integral. So this is going to be a function, and we're going to think of it, little f here as a function of a variable t. So I'll put a dt here at the end. And we're going to integrate f from a all the way up to, well, somewhere in between a and b. Okay, so I'm going to call that x. And that's why this big F is a function of x, not of t. Right? If I integrate F from a to x, the answer will depend on the x that I choose. So this F, right, this big F, is a function of the x that I choose. Okay? Okay. So the statement then is, well, the first part at least of this statement is that big F is continuous. So this is a neat way to build a new function using an integral. And in fact, because you're defining it as an integral itself, that somehow is going to give you a continuous function, which is really cool. But wait, there's more. So all we assumed up here was that f was some integrable function. That allows me to build a new function, which is continuous, hence integrable, right? Like continuity implies integrability. But if we even know that this little f is a continuous function, then we can even say more. Okay, so this is the first bit. The second bit is if f, little f, is continuous on a, b, at, or in fact, let's even just say it at a specific point, right? We, can, we don't even have to do it on the entire interval, right? This is even stronger, right? So let's say uh, is continuous at some c, 
in the interval a, b. That's even better. Then, so this is our second statement, big F is an antiderivative. of little f at c. Okay, so just to be clear, right, this means if f, big F, is an antiderivative of little f at c, this means that big F is differentiable. So, all right, we knew it was going to be continuous, right, but it's actually differentiable at c. And if I take the derivative of big F at c, I get little f of c. Okay, so if we happen to know that little f is continuous on the entire interval a, b, then, okay, we just say this all the time, and that's where you're going to get a statement that would say something like, okay, if I differentiate this, this f here, right, this is this big f, this is the derivative of the integral. And this tells me I would just get little f of x. Okay, so whatever this, this variable is, and I don't think of it now as a, a function of t, at the end I'll, I'll get a function of x out. Okay. All right. So that's, this is just when you get this extra assumption, right, that little f is actually continuous. All right, so let's go to it, right? Let's, let's prove this. So um, what a... I actually am going to prove is a little stronger, right? Let's go back to our our theorem at the beginning. We actually concluded in this theorem that this big F, which is going to show up in our first fundamental theorem, is uniformly continuous. And, and that's what we're going to do here, right? So in fact, I'm not just going to be showing that F, big F is continuous, but even uniformly continuous. Okay, that's pretty great. Okay, so let's jump into the proof. So um, I'm going to show that f is uniformly continuous by showing that this difference quotient, or at least the absolute value, is always bounded by some positive constant for any x and y that are not equal. Of course, if they're not equal, then one of them is bigger. So without loss of generality, we're going to assume that x is less than y and they're both contained in the interval a, b. Okay, now, we know that little f is integrable, okay? which means that it is bounded. We also know then that the absolute value of f is bounded. Okay, so since little f is integrable, both f and the absolute value of f are bounded. Okay, remember, integrability always assumes uh, we have a bounded function. Okay, well, since the absolute value of f is bounded, it has an upper bound. So let's let m, and we'll just take any positive number that, uh, that works, be an upper bound. for the absolute value of f. Okay, so if we want to prove that big F is uniformly continuous, we need to say something about the difference quotient, right? This guy over here. Fine. So we have, if I take the absolute value of f of y minus f of x, and then divide by y minus x. That's our difference quotient. Notice I don't need the absolute value on the bottom because I'm assuming y is greater than x. Okay, simple thing there. Okay, well, let's see. We defined big F in a very particular way. We defined it in terms of an integral. So down here we can copy. I have the integral from a to y, f dt, minus the integral from a to x, f dt. Okay, and then we'll divide by y minus x. Ah, but if I'm integrating from 
a to y, and I subtract from a to x. So let's just draw a little, little line over here. So I have a, I have x, and I have y, right? We knew y was greater than x. So if I integrate all the way from a to y, so this bit here, and then I subtract from a to x, then I'm left with this bit from x to y. So this will be the absolute value of the integral from x to y of f dt over y minus x. All right, but in our integration property video, we showed that if you take the absolute value of an integral, it will be less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value function. So this will be less than or equal to the integral from x to y of the absolute value of f dt divided by y minus x. Ah, but we know that the absolute value of f has an upper bound, namely m. And we showed that if the absolute value of f, this function, is less than or equal to some constant, then this integral will be less than or equal to that constant times the length of the interval, which in this case is y minus x. Ah, the y minus x is cancel, and we're just less than or equal to m. Okay, so by the theorem, this implies that f is uniformly continuous on AB. Hey, that's not too shabby. Okay, next, we get to assume that the little f is continuous at some point C. So next, assume little f is continuous at some C between A and B. Okay, so our goal now is to actually show that this big F that we've defined is even differentiable and has derivative F of C. Okay, so let's take a look then. Uh, I guess we'll just go to the definition of the derivative. All right, so I'm gonna take the limit as X approaches C of F of X minus F of C over X minus C. Uh, okay, let's rewrite this now because we know each of these big F's is defined as an integral. So let's see, this will be the limit as X goes to C. I'll uh, pull this X minus C on the denominator out to the front. Okay, so F of X is the integral from A to X of little f dt minus the integral here from A to C little f dt. Ah, this is the same setup we had in the previous step. So I can rewrite this now. It's the limit, x goes to c, 1 over x minus c, and now this will be the integral from c to x, f dt. Right? So again, this is this picture. I'm going from a, and then uh, we could have a c, and we can have an x. Now, I don't actually know, in this case, which one is bigger, c or x. Uh, what I do know, though, is I'm integrating from A to X. I'm getting rid of the stuff from A to C. And so I'll be left with the stuff from C to X, which could be actually um, end up having a, you know, kind of a wonky sign if the C is on the wrong side. But it doesn't really matter. Okay. So what we're going to show is that this limit, right, which we haven't computed yet. We've just uh, rewritten it. We're going to show that this equals f of c. Okay, this will show us that number one, big F is differentiable, because this is going to be the derivative, and it's going to show us that the derivative equals little f of c. All right, so if I want to show that a certain limit exists, uh, well, I need an epsilon. So let's let epsilon be greater than zero. Now we have not used that little f is continuous yet, so why don't we use that? Since little f is continuous at C, that tells me that there exists some positive delta. So there exists, let's call it delta of epsilon greater than zero, such that uh, if T 
is in the interval a b and uh, t and c are within delta of epsilon of each other then f of t and f of c will be within epsilon okay that's just our definition of continuity fine therefore if x is something in the interval a b such that x and c are within delta of epsilon of each other then okay let's look at this 1 over x minus c integral bit so if i just copy that i integrate from c to x f dt and i want to know how far away that is from f of c right because again i'm trying to claim that these are equal and if i can show their say um uh, less than epsilon for all epsilon well there we go so let's see what we get this is equal to absolute value okay there's a little trick i'm going to play i'm going to write this down then I'll, I'll show you the trick what i'm doing so i want to move this f of c inside the integral Ooh, is that allowed what did I just do there? Is that really okay? Well, here's the, the secret in the background, right? So if I integrate a constant, so say I integrated, uh, I don't know, from C to X, and I just integrate, uh, well, even 1 dt, then this is just going to be the length of the interval. Okay, This is just equal to X minus C. If I put a constant in there, like, I don't know, maybe x minus, uh, or f of c, well, the f of c I can just pull out. We know we can pull constants outside of integrals. And so this would end up being f of c times x minus c. Ah, but notice I also have this 1 over x minus c living out here. So if I distributed right so if i if i first integrate each of these individually one of them will be the integral of f of c which is f of c times x minus c but then i'll distribute this one over x minus c that'll kill that x minus c and i just get f of c so these really are the same thing i'm just playing this kind of magic game where i know ah if i have a constant outside of an integral i can put it inside the integral provided that I have divided by the length. If I didn't divide by the length, well, then I'd have to put the, the length times f of c inside the integral. Anyhow, uh, now what do I know about f and f of c? Well, what we showed up here was that whenever I take something, right, which is within delta of c, then I'm going to have that the f images of those points, right, f of t and then whatever this f of c is, less than epsilon. Well, I'm assuming here that x and c are within delta. So when I compute the difference between anything between c and x, right, the f image of that and f of c, it's going to be less than epsilon. So this is less than epsilon for every point between c and x okay if i left that interval right if i started just you know with anything in the interval a b this is definitely not true but it's definitely true with points that are between c and x because we know c and x are within delta and because we know that anything within delta will have this property okay but that means now that when i integrate this is going to be less than the absolute value of 1 over x minus c epsilon times x minus c okay i can replace this function with the larger epsilon now it's a constant and i multiply by the length there we go of course the 1 over x minus c and the x minus c will cancel and so this is equal to well the absolute values go away because epsilon is positive so there we go we've shown that this quantity and f of c differ by less than epsilon.
and this was for all epsilon. Thus, the limit exists. Okay, that's it. So this implies that the derivative of f at c is equal to little f of c. Okay, and that, and of course, this of course means that big f, you know, is differentiable. So there he is. Crazy. Okay, so that's the proof of the first fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, in the homework, you'll get to play around with utilizing this theorem. Uh, there's a lots of uh, really cool extensions of it, with the chain rule, uh, Leibniz does some really great thing, but that's where we're going to stop here. In the next video, we will prove, hey, you guessed it, the second fundamental theorem of calculus. We'll see you next time.